and do with your sweet smart self this morning as we get into the word of his grace amen mm -mm -mm. all right we've been examining the relationships of the new creation creation and we've been looking at you know under the theme wisdom for living uh, this week is going to be a bit more intensive because this week I'm going to be teaching every day, every day from this, from tomorrow, right up to the end of the month, into the first week of June, because I want to quickly, you know, get done with all the relationship teachings and then get into TED season six before we, you know, uh, begin to prepare for 30 days of glory 2021. All right. So I'd like you to get yourself ready to be in the services every evening. Um, by the end of the service, I'll talk about how we're going to be meeting. Of course, not in the building, right in the houses, but I'm going to announce how we will go about that. All right? So let's get in the world. The relationships of the new creature. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. Now, therefore, if any man be in Christ is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, see. See, behold, see, look, all things are become new. We have been looking at the relationships of the new creature, creature or a new creation as a child of God who is born of God. The Bible teaches us how to relate. Whom and who we should relate with and who we cannot be relating with or how we can relate with different kinds of people that exist in the world. That same Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 again. Second Corinthians 5 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Next verse 18. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now verse 16 of that scripture drives the point home. Verse 16. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea though we have known Christ after the flesh. Yet now henceforth know we him no more. Alright so we do not estimate or value people naturally. We estimate and value people via the eyes of the scripture or via the eyes of God's word. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. <clears throat> Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Look at verse 15. <clears throat> And what concord had Christ? He calls you Christ and he calls the unbeliever Belial. Or what part had he that believeth? He calls the unbeliever an infidel. Next verse. Next verse. And what agreement had the temple of God? He calls you the temple of God. He calls the unbeliever idols. For you are the temple of the living God. As God had said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Look at the next verse now, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. Save the Lord and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So we see a distinction in humanity. Some people are temple of idols, and some people are temples of God. So we are not all the same. We can look alike. The way we dress, the way we move, the way we talk. Even sometimes we could resemble one another. But you see, we are essentially, we differ based on our decisions towards the gospel. When a man decides to receive the gospel, he's the temple of God. When a man resists the gospel, he's the temple of idols. See, he is a child of the devil. If you believe the gospel, you are a son of God. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Even as many, even to them that believe on his name. 
So if you have believed in the name of Jesus, you are a son of God or you are a child of God. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 3 verse 1 and 2. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father had bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Next verse. Beloved, now are we now. So before now we were not. But now are we the sons of God. Alright. So we are the sons of God today. Can somebody say to me very loud, I am a son of God now. That is the identity of anyone who has believed in the gospel. The son of God. We now begin to talk about the relationships that we have. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says something. Amos chapter 3 verse number 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Except they be agreed. That question is rhetorical. It's not saying that you cannot walk. I mean, many of us have people we relate with that we don't exactly like. We don't like them, but we relate with them anyway. You know, and uh, we have something we want to gain from them. That's why we relate with them. Not that we like them. It's just that there's something we want to gain from them. So we keep relating with them. Maybe business or maybe somebody who's very brilliant in a particular field. Very brilliant and you want to tap into his mind. You want to tap. You, have, you want to download brilliance from his brain. You don't like him. You don't like his face. You don't like his attitude. But you like his brilliance. So you relate with him. To get that brilliance out of him to yourself. So that's the only reason why you hang around. Maybe in your class as a student. You know you just want to roll with the guy. So you can pass exams. Because he has a way of simplifying things. When he explains them to you. Now the question here therefore. Is not just about you agreeing or relating with people. The question has to do with compatibility. Can two work together? Compatibility. Can you be compatible with someone except you are alike that is can you and someone be compatible if you are not alike that's what he was talking about that's the same question brother paul was asking how in the world can light dwell with darkness how in the world can darkness and light stay together there's no meeting point between darkness and light there's no meeting point between the believer and the unbeliever there's no meeting point where we become friends and intimate friends with unbelievers. No meeting point, no alliance between unbelievers and believers. There's no way a believer and unbeliever can relate. The Bible says clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33, Do not be deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. Evil communications corrupt good manners. We said that when you come into Christ, you are born into a new family. Born again brings you into a new family. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18. A lot of scriptures, but very good for your health. For Ephesians 2 18. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Both Jew and Gentile. Next verse, 19. Now therefore... You are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So, we now belong to the household of God. Galatians chapter 6 verse 10. Galatians chapter 6 verse number 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us good, do good unto all men as Especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Take note of the word especially. So there's a household of faith. The word household means family. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14. Brother Paul explains it clearer. Ephesians 3 verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Next verse. Of whom the whole family family in heaven and on earth is named. So there's a family and you are a part of that family. 
I have been teaching you to show you that when someone is in that family, you and the person are now blood brothers. You are, you are now real family. You are the real family. You are actually a mem you are members of an eternal family, an eternal union, a union that continues after this life. And we have seen so far that that spiritual relationship in the scriptures has a higher priority than a natural relationship because that particular relationship goes beyond the earth. One time they asked Jesus about the woman who married seven husbands. In the resurrection, whose wife is she? For they all had her. Jesus said to them, in the resurrection, there's no marriage. That means the earthly relationship stops here. It ends here. It is here you will know that you are somebody's husband, you are somebody's wife. When this life is over, when you leave this world, you won't even think like that. Such thought will not cross your mind. You won't see somebody and say, my wife on earth. You won't even remember that there was something called wife and husband. It terminates here. It ends here. It does not exist beyond this life. But you and, you and me in Christ, our union is eternal. After this life, we remain brothers and sisters. After this life, we remain family. Am I communicating here? Yeah. It's eternal and it's superior to natural family relationships. That's why if you have a brother or a sister who is not born again, you need to be concerned because if they don't get born again and they die, that's the end. You will never see them and they will never see you forever. It ends here. All right? So, you know, um, the spiritual relationship therefore is superior. All right? Because the, help, the earthly relationship do not have heavenly continuity. So that relationship in the body of Christ is more important. And I think we explored that from Lazarus and the rich man. Do you remember? We saw Lazarus and the rich man and it has no bearing on the eternities of men. So people in church who are born again are your brothers. Can you turn to someone and say, you're my brother, you're my sister? Please don't call a sister my brother. Say, you're my brother, you're my sister. <laughs> The point I'm making is that we are in the same family. Glory to God. Is somebody not happy to know that all of these are your brothers and sisters? Can I have a powerful amen? amen. Church is family. And I love to be with my family. Church is family. This is the family of God. And I love to see my family. You, you, you know, this is your inner caucus. This is your own company. Hallelujah. Then we looked at other kinds of relationships. You look at marriage last Sunday. How many of you were blessed last Sunday? Glory. A brother told me, a husband told me, he said, Papa, last Sunday was lit. And I said, what happened? He said, look, Papa, if you like next Sunday, use knife and cut us as husbands. For giving us last Sunday, we are happy. Beat us if you want to beat us. Do anything you want to do with us as husbands. But that you said what you said last Sunday, we are very happy. All right, wait till I finish with you this Sunday. <laughs> Glory to God. So we have to be careful how we, what we read. Because those things really have a lot of influence on us. The kind of materials we expose ourselves to. All of these many marriage seminars, mingle, single. You have to be very careful with them. Careful with them. A lot of them are taught from the worldly point of view. A lot of them are taught from the secular point of view and they contradict your identity. And when you start feeding on those things, you have identity crisis. You have to stay away from them. You don't need all those things. The word of God is more than enough. What you cannot get from the word of God, you don't need it. What you cannot get from the word of God, you don't need it. Did you hear what I said? You know, all those books that are all over your shelf, marry before 30, how to keep a husband, how to nourish your husband, get, to, to flush those things away. If you spend the time you read those books on the Bible, you will be a better person. Not just a better person in marriage, a better person all around. The word of God is final authority. And it must remain like that in every area of your life. Can I have a good Amen. A Christian should not have a divorce. You shouldn't. Don't even think of it. It should even cross your mind. Now I'm not going into the details of whether divorce is right or wrong. I'm just giving you the basic scriptural standpoint. 
Don't even think about it. That should not be the question. A Christian should not divorce. See, don't think about it. It's, it's, it's the world that, def, that brings all of those things. Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to divorce. Who are those with a hard heart? Those that are not born again. The believer has a new heart. The believer has a heart of flesh. You don't have a hard heart. So you shouldn't even think in those lines. Glory to God. I said glory to God. We follow the world. We do what the world says. Say with me, I am what the world says I am. Say with me louder, the word of God is final authority in my life. I didn't have a good amen. amen. Colossians chapter 3 verse 18. Colossians chapter 3 verse number 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And I told you not to submit to men because they are men. The only man you should submit to is your husband. Your husband. Every other person you submit to must merit that submission. He must merit it. Either your boss at work, not because he's a man, but because he's your boss. Or your pastor, because he's your pastor. That's why Paul emphasizes on your own husband. And I'm sure you noted that last week. You have no authority over someone else's wife. It is your own husband or your own wife. Now, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Next verse. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. That's an instruction to born again couples. I hope you remember that. That's not an instruction to a, a Christian married to an unbeliever. Or an unbeliever married to a Christian. This instruction in everything is for two believers. Husband, believer, wife, believer. You submit in everything. But if the husband is an unbeliever, we looked at it from First Peter. All right, Because they are two different relationships. They are not the same. And how they function is not the same because of the faith involved. All right? And we read from 2 Peter chapter 3, we saw the instructions given to a wife who is married to a, an unbelieving husband. Not that she married him as a Christian, but two of them were married as two unbelievers. Then the wife got born again. How to treat the husband who is yet to be born again. If a Christian woman marries an unbeliever, I don't know how you should treat him. Because you opened your eye and you went into it. You knew what you were doing, so you deliberately made the choice to eat, the tree, to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the outcome, bless your heart with it. <laughs> Alright, so that marriage is between two parties. We established that last week. Marriage is between two parties. Husband and wife. Minus children. Minus my mommy, minus my daddy, minus my uncle, minus my best friend. Marriage is between two people, husband and wife. There are only two parties involved in marriage. Not children. Children are the fruits of the relationship. Children are the fruit of the relationship of a husband and a wife. And I've had women say, I'm only in this marriage because of my children. You are not in marriage. You are a caretaker of children. If you are just in that marriage because of children, you are the nanny of the children. You are not in marriage. You are just in that house as a nanny for the children. If it's only the children keeping you, you are no more in marriage. You are just a nanny in that house. And you better tell yourself that's what you are. Because that's exactly what you are. Because what you're doing in that house is what any nanny could do. Because you're no more in marriage. You're just a nanny taking care of those children. And it's possible those children will grow and not look at your face tomorrow. And you don't have to make, take it personal. You make the decision, but you don't determine the outcome of that decision. Okay? That's hard. 
But I'm going to get more into that as we proceed. <clears throat> now, notice it appears like whenever a man goes to Ephesians chapter 5, he chooses to just stay with wives. Wives. Submit your own husbands. And it looks like when women go to that Ephesians chapter 5, they stay with husbands. Love your own wives. It looks like women make the husband their problem and husbands make the wives their problem. Why don't you stay on your lane? Stay with your own. Wife, you have your own, stay with it. Husbands, you have your own, stay with it. Everybody stay with your own. Don't leave your own and be trying to help me see my own. I have eyes. Because while you are busy helping me to see my own, you are not seeing your own. So why don't you focus on your own and do your own? Teaching good? Everybody stay on your lane. Can I hear you say that? <laughs> if we both mind our business, you read the one that is for you, I read the one that is for me, and we take our business seriously, we will have no problem. If I mind my business and I take my business seriously, you mind your business and you take your business seriously, there will be no problem. It's when you are not minding your business, you become a busybody. In other people's matters. Some people just like to use the Bible to manipulate. Submit, 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 submit. The Bible didn't say husband, tell your wives. And the Bible didn't say wife, tell your husband. It said husbands. Love your wife. Read your own. Amen. Amen. Now, look at that Ephesians again, chapter 5, verse 22 to 32 now. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Next verse. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Next verse. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth even as the Lord, the church. <clears throat> Next verse. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So brother Paul talks about husbands and wives. But how many times does he talk to the woman? Look at the, the, the verses where brother Paul talks to the woman is only in three verses. Ephesians 5, 22, 23, and 24. Three times. Only three verses. The man, he talks to the man in seven verses. Wife, three verses. Man, seven. Man, he talks to the man from verse 25 to 33. So who has a greater responsibility in marriage? The man. So he has a greater responsibility. And if you observe, when he gives instructions about the children, he doesn't talk to the mothers. He talks to the fathers. He says fathers when talking to the children. He said nothing to the mothers. So the responsibility for the children is majorly on the fathers. We will get to that. <clears throat> so who is the husband? Huh? Who is your husband? No, don't say the man because you could be gay to man. Say the male. <laughs> say the male. Okay. Who is who is the husband? 
and the female is the woman, okay, or the wife. The man in the marriage who, who is the husband has greater responsibilities because he is to model Christ. The husband is to model Christ. And the responsibility to model Christ is huge. The man is to model Christ. While the woman is to model the believer in Christ. The man is to model Christ. While the woman is to model the believer in Christ. The man is to model Christ. He is to model Jesus in marriage. So the question is. The man you want to marry and you cannot sleep at night because you want to marry that man. Most times, that man that is keeping that girl awake is sleeping. So the question is, who is really keeping you awake? You can't sleep. Maybe a demon somewhere. The man must act as Jesus. Now, that instruction can never be to an unbeliever. An unbeliever can never act as Jesus. Because an unbeliever doesn't have the capacity to act as Jesus. He's not born again. The husband must love as Christ. Which means that instruction is for Christians. Because only believers can act as Christ. Unbelievers don't have the capacity. They don't have the wherewithal. They don't have the resources. Because the, the word husband, love your wives, is the same word for John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. Agapo. Agape. Agapo. It means sacrifice. That love is sacrifice. It's not a bunch of emotions. I feel, I don't feel. No, that love, your wives, is sacrifice. To give your life to someone. To give your life to someone. Most of the time, it is the woman in the, you know, in most of those lustful relationships that says, I will give you everything. But the wife is not asked to give her life. Is the man that is asked to give his life. Because Christ gave his life. The church received. Christ gave. The woman receives. The man gives. The woman doesn't give her life. The woman receives the man's life. But some women will give their life, give their shoe, give their leg, give their everything. Misplaced priority. The woman don't give, the woman receives. Just like the church didn't give Christ everything, anything, the church only received what Christ gave. Teaching good. I'm not saying you shouldn't give your heart to, your, to the man, but I'm saying it is the responsibility of the man to give his all to the wife because he is supposed to mirror Christ in the marriage so a christian relationship must model jesus that is why man as a man you cannot just marry anybody you cannot i've seen people ruin their lives i've seen people ru ruin their purpose in life because they made a wrong decision in marriage they ruin everything Let me tell you something. There is no believer that is not aware of a wrong decision before he makes it. If you are writing, write it in capital letters. There is no believer that is not aware of a wrong, a wrong decision before he makes it. Every time you are about to make a wrong decision, you always know it. Except you are not born again. There's no Christian that is not aware of a wrong decision 
before making it because Romans chapter 8 verse 14 Romans 8 14 says for as many as are led by the spirit of God they are the sons of God next verse next verse 15 for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father next verse next verse the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There is a witness of the spirit that a child of God has. So when you are about to make a wrong decision, that witness of the spirit gives you signals. That witness of the spirit gives you signals. Either negative signals or positive ones. You will know it in your knowing. Look at John chapter 8 verse 12. John chapter 8 verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Say with me very loud, I have the light of life. I do not walk in darkness. See, the believer never is taken on awares in making decisions. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. It's just that sometimes we ignore the voice and we make wrong decisions. But you can never claim not to have known that the Spirit of God gave you a signal or called your attention. It's just that the Spirit of God will not force you. He will not push you. No, he will, he will just whisper it to you. Leaving you to make the ultimate decision. So when you get into trouble for decisions, know that you knew ahead of time. And if you're going to be sincere with yourself, you will know. You will know that the Spirit of God gave you signals and and warned you concerning that decision. Oftentimes we refuse to follow the leading of the spirit of God. So how does he do it? Number one, firstly from the written word of God. That's number one. From the written word of God. Abraham sent his servants to get Isaac a wife. But look at the instruction he gave the servant. You must not take a wife from Canaan. It must be from Abraham's tribe. It must be from Abraham's nation. It must be from Abraham's family. Why? Because this, the written word of God clearly tells you, you cannot be unequally yoked with unbelievers. It's written in black and white. You will not hear another instruction if you ignore that one that is already written in black and white. You know that you and an unbeliever have nothing in common. So when you start romancing an unbeliever, know that the spirit of God will not go beyond that first instruction that you ignored. Who wants to keep giving instruction when the first one you gave is ignored and trampled upon? There's no point. You do obey the first one, will you obey the second one? So already you've seen it, you and an unbeliever have nothing in common. And then you start dating an unbeliever and you're asking God, is it your will? What's it? What, what are, you, what? are you tempting the Lord your God? Father, show me this man. Some people have come to me for counseling. Papa, there's this guy that wants to marry me. Well, is he a believer? He's not a believer, but he has the fear of God. When a lady wants to deceive herself, she will look for vocabulary to decorate her stupidity. He's not a believer, but he has a fear. How can you have the fear of God when you're not a believer? What is the fear of God? Say, I'm going out with an unbeliever. Let us know. Just be direct. Don't, 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 don't be smart. Because at the end of the day, you will harvest what you're sowing. I won't be there to partake of the harvest. Tell yourself the truth, even if it's painful. Even if you want to do the bad thing, just know. So that as you're doing it, you know that I know what I am doing. Then be ready for the outcome. Don't come and be crying, oh God, after I have served you, allow me to marry this stupid man. No, God, did he allow you? You made a choice. And you knew that this guy was going to be, he's going to be what he is. It was clear from the day you were choosing. There's no rocket science about it. I'm teaching good. Whenever I see people insist and get stubborn, and try to prove a point by marrying certain people. <laughs> it's funny. You know. See a man saying she gives me joy and fulfillment. I know she's not a Christian. But when I see her, my happiness is fulfilled. She completes my joy. She's not a Christian. But when I think about her, I feel an anointing to pray. <laughs> 
Paralegizomai. You know what paralegizomai is? Mentally agitated. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Marriage is not for joyless people. Write it in capital letters. Marriage is not for joyless people. Marriage is not a rehab center. It's not for joyless people. Marriage is not a rehab center. You don't marry to go and be rehabilitated. It's not for joyless people. You don't marry to have joy. You have to have joy before you marry. Marriage is not for joyless people. That's why most people put pressure on their husband or wife. Because they are going into marriage with expectations. Great and mighty ones. And they miss it. You don't have joy. Then you marry somebody to give you joy. And because he doesn't have what it takes to give you joy, you're frustrated. Hey, you don't marry to get joy. If you don't have joy, don't marry. Don't go and make somebody's life sad. You have to have joy. You have to be complete in yourself before you marry. Because marriage is a contribution. Marriage is not for people that are broke emotionally, broke mentally. No, you have to have joy. You have to be complete in yourself in Christ. Then when you marry, you bring contribution to the relationship. She brings her own contribution. Now it makes two of you better. Teaching good. Some people just insist. That's what I want. That's what I want. Pastor, I like that girl. That's what I want. I remember somebody in this church. I warned him. I spoke to him. I called him to my office. I said, brother, please, I beg you, don't marry that girl. Two of you don't look up compatible. I'm your pastor. I have seen. I'm not going to marry her. At the end of the day, she has to marry somebody, but not you. Two of you don't fit each other. He said, okay, papa. Then again, he, he continued. I called him. I called her. I said, don't marry him. You will make your lives miserable, both of you. You don't fit. Ah, oh, Papa, don't say that. Ah, oh, Papa, don't say that. In fact, one of the days I was talking to him about not marrying her in my office and trying to make him see why he shouldn't do it. Because once they decide it's over, I can't say anything. But before they decide, at least I can persuade. She sneaked and it's dropped into our conversation and became bitter against me. Eventually, they got married because I couldn't stop them. And what kind of marriage did they have? Very miserable. Both of them are dead now. Both of them are dead. They killed each other. Both of them. I'm not happy saying it because it pains me. They could have been here today. They could have lived a more fulfilling and rewarding life. But they made that choice. And from the day they made that choice, their lives never remained the same. Never. The man will be in church when it's time for offering. He wants to bring out offering. She will land him a slap in his hands. Power! Take your hand out. And because he doesn't want a show, he will remove his hand. He can't put offering. That's not a marriage. But they made a choice. You make the choice, but you don't determine the outcome of the choice. The choice is yours, but the outcome is not in your control. I'm teaching good. That's just one out of a few others. Out of a few others. I remember one lady got married from this church, married somebody from somewhere. And the man stopped her from going to any church. Any. If she tries it, he will give her the beating of her life. Sometimes she had to sneak and come for counseling. What to do? I say, I don't know what you can do. I don't know. I don't know. Only the Lord knows the way to the wilderness. Me, I don't know. <laughs> Some people just insist what I want. This is what I want. Their parents will say no. Pastor will say no. Other brethren that are responsible will say no. Think about it. They say no. This is what I want. The book of Judges tells us about a man whose name is Samson. Judges chapter 14 verse 1. Put it up for me. 
Judges chapter 14 verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Next verse. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Get her for me to wife. Next verse. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines, unbelievers by today's standard? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleased me well. I love her. If I don't marry her, I will die. It's a lie. If anything happens to her now, you don't marry her, you will still be alive. All those emotional jargons. Get them out of your head and think straight. Marry a sister in the church. They are, they are tongue-talking sisters. Holy Ghost baptized. No, that one. Please let me. That's a very wrong idea about marriage. Your marriage is not supposed to please you. Your marriage is supposed to please God. It's supposed to please God. In 1 Corinthians 7, 39, Brother Paul said, you may marry whoever you want, but it must be in the Lord. It must, it must be, he says, you, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. Only in the Lord. Brother Paul says, if you marry, marry. Only in the Lord. Why? Because that is the marriage that pleases, that pleases God. She says, this guy is cool. He's humorous. But does he please God? He makes you laugh. You laugh till you fall on the ground. But does he please God? He's, a, he's not a believer, but he's a neutral Christian. I've never heard that before. Neutral Christian? <laughs> neutral. <laughs> neutral shoe polish. <laughs> Some guys, when they know that their choice is wrong, and you're talking, they'll say, but is there anybody perfect? Is there anybody perfect? You know, I've been doing marriage counseling all my life. So, so that relationship between Samson and that daughter of Philistine went off. Again, Samson had this love for strange women. Samson was a very strange human being. He only loved strange women. Strange, nothing familiar. Then he met Delilah. He kept pursuing strange women till he arrived at Delilah. Final bust up. Some people are like that. They were in a relationship before, then they get into another relationship, and then they don't they don't pray enough or study the word of God. They get into another one. So he went again and met Delilah. A daughter of the devil. Delilah devil. Didi. They were so close that the man of God lost his sensibilities. She began to ask what she shouldn't ask for. Demands. You either love me or your church. Choose. Choose. You either love me or your church. Every time you're in church, every time. Do you love me or your church? Choose. Let me know now so I know how to go away. Anybody that will ask you to choose between him and the church is Satan incarnate. Choose me or your church. And there are people that have been asked that question and they chose the woman. Yeah. I chose the man. You either love me or you love your ministry. Which one do you love? Me or your ministry? Choose. Selfish relationships. And what was the end of something? We all know the story. Delilah put him 
Look at the kind of questions Delilah was asking Samson. Where is the secret of your power? Where is the secret of your power? Let me see it. What do you want to do with it? If you don't tell me the secret of your power, you don't love me. <laughs> there are questions people ask you, you should take off. When you hear the sound of the question, you should know that this is Satan in the physical. Get it behind me, Satan. That's Peter. You're married and you're always angry that your wife is on fire for God. You have a problem as a man. Or you're always angry that your husband is on fire for God. As a woman, you have a major problem. You have a big problem. It's either you're lagging in zeal. Or you two need to get busy. Get busy for God. Start a fellowship. If your husband is pastoring one, start another one. When you are busy and he's busy serving the Lord, you will not be asking him to choose between you and God. Because you will also know that God is ultimate. You talk about how you're doing it. You talk about how you're making exploits. You're talking about how you're raising disciples. You talk about your experience in raising disciples. You share how the prayer meeting went, how the Bible study went. Each one of you is on fire for God. That is a relationship that pleases the Lord. You know, in, in, in relationships, you must consider, you must consider a person's spiritual background. It's critical. Spiritual background. Is he a Christian? Yes. What is the level of his Christianity? That's very important. How committed, how dedicated is he or is she? Bible tells us that unbelievers are under the power of the prince of the air. The spirit that walketh in the children of disobedience. And of course you must remember if you marry an unbelieving woman, she cannot submit to you as the church submits to Christ. She cannot. She cannot. She will bring worldliness into your life. If you marry a man that is not born again, he cannot love you as Christ loves the church. You must remember that. So you won't be wrong using your Bible or using the Bible for your marriage. Because if you refuse to use the Bible, you will use other materials. You know? They are simbi. You know those columns in newspaper. Dear Simbi, I have a marital problem. I need counseling. If you refuse the Bible counseling you, those newspaper columns will counsel you, magazine columns will you know, counsel you. Dear Simbi, I don't know what to do with my husband. My husband is always coming late at night. Simbi will write, in my own opinion, divorce him. Is it not Simbi you are talking to? Since you refuse the Bible, you will use magazine and newspapers. You will talk to Simbi. <laughs> I don't know how I remember CB. Where is CB coming from? <laughs> Praise God. Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> now, remember if you date an unbeliever, you are dating the devil. If you date an unbeliever, you are dating the devil. Tell your neighbor, don't date the devil. He's a good toaster. He can take you for movies. He can take you to the best restaurants. But he will never take you to church. If you date an unbeliever, you are dating the devil. Now, Colossians chapter 3 verse 19. <clears throat> Colo. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Underline bitter against them. Be not bitter against them. The word bitter there means don't be harsh. Harsh, harsh. Some husbands are very harsh. The words they use are harsh. Their voice is harsh. Even the way they will, even the way they will touch their wife. Even in the public, you're touching your wife. You're trying to help. Put your hand on her shoulder. When you land the hand, it, it is pain. The end. You are harsh in all areas. Everything about you is harsh. Your words are harsh. Your voice is harsh. Your hands are harsh. Uh, uh. Don't 
be bitter. <laughs> don't be bitter against them. Ephesians 5.25. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Love your wives as Christ loves the church. How did he love the church? He gave himself for it. He gave himself for it. 26 to 30. Look at how, how he gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Next verse. That he might present it to himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Next verse. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth himself. 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Next verse. Next verse. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So he gives the man the responsibility to act like Jesus in the marriage. He must love. How does Jesus love us? Number one, Jesus gives himself to us. A husband must give himself to his wife. Jesus gives himself to us. Jesus lays down his life for us. That's the love of Jesus. So, the love of Jesus is demonstrated in actions. It's not in mere words. I know some of us are very poetic. But you see, Jesus did not come to the world and give us a poem to read. He demonstrated his love by giving himself to us. He gave himself to us and for us. How did he give himself to us and for us? Number one, forgiveness. Number one, forgiveness. It's below your office as a man to hold a grudge against your wife. It's below your office. Below your office as a man to hold a grudge against your wife. You must, you must as a husband, you must as a husband, as a, it's a responsibility given to you by God to love your wife with forgiveness. Love your wife with forgiveness. Love your wife with forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 and 2. Be therefore followers of God as their children and walk in love. Even as Christ also had loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So you must show forgiveness in your conduct and in your words. It's below your office as a husband. If there's a hurt in your house, the first person to demonstrate love is the man. Forgiveness is not just a question of, I know you were wrong, I am sorry. No. That's not what it is. Forgiveness, according to the word of God, is when you take the wrong of the other person and assume it as yours. You take your wife's wrong. She wronged you, but now as a husband, you take her wrong upon yourself and make it your own wrong. Her wrong becomes your wrong. Okay? You get in her place. And after taking the wrong, you forgive her and release her and treat her like she didn't do it. Because you assumed the wrong. So you no more see her with the eyes of the person who did the wrong. You see her with the eyes of the person who never did the wrong. Because the wrong is on you. So since it's on you, you forgive. That's what Jesus did. He came, took our place, took our wrong on himself and gave us forgiveness. That's the way the husband must treat the wife. Because the husband models Christ. And if he models Christ, he acts like Christ in the relationship. Jesus assumed our responsibilities. He assumed our faults and our sins. As a husband and as a man, you must train yourself in forgiveness. A husband must train himself in sacrificial life. 
You must. That's how to be a husband in Christ. You forgive. Not just, darling, this thing you did is not good. Though. Okay, I forgive you, but don't do it next time. No. You take the wrong on yourself and give her forgiveness and never see her with the eyes of the person who did it. So it's not a matter of this is the second time I'm warning you. If it gets to number three, you may not escape it. No. You, you take her out of the wrong. You step into the wrong. You give her forgiveness. That means she never did it. That means if the chips are down, you did it. That's, that's, that's the way to do it. So that way you never see her because you have to present her to yourself without spot or rico. Every time you look at her, she must be stainless. Every time you look at her, she must have never done any wrong before. Otherwise, you're not acting like Christ. You're betraying yourself. You're suffering from mental agitation. Today, in sister's voice. <laughs> Sisters' voices are coming up. The volume is rising. <laughs> but that's the Bible. Say with me, I do the word of God. Every man say, I do the word of God. Today, the men's voices are better than last Sunday when I was asking sisters to say after me. Uh, they gave me meditation voice. <laughs> praise God. I say, praise God. So, you must learn to love. You must learn to forgive. You don't recall past events as a husband you don't don't ever do it last time mm -mm, don't Christ never does that Christ never comes to us to say you remember what you did the other time when he hits number 10 you will see my red eyes no there's no such thing Christ presents you to himself always as a church without spot or recall or any such thing every time Christ sees you he sees you through the eyes of his cross Forgiven, justified, purified, stainless, spotless. So a husband must see his wife like that all the time. All the time. Nothing like last time. There's no last time. There's no record of wrongs. Your sins and iniquities, I will remember them again no more. That's the love of Christ. And that's the love of a husband in Christ. Number two. How is love demonstrated? When a husband is loving his wife, he is tolerant. Tolerance. You must learn to tolerate. Tolerate. How many of you know that Jesus tolerates all of us? He tolerates all of us. We are all tolerated folks. He allows us to make mistakes. Jesus allows us to make mistakes. 1 John chapter 2 verse 2. My little children, if any man sin, we have an advocate. He allows us to make mistakes. He tolerates us. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Forgiveness must flow from the husband. You must be the first to take action. There must be no form of bitterness in your home. Any form of it. There must be zero tolerance for bitterness in your home. Because any home where there is bitterness and anger and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. So you must have zero tolerance for bitterness. It's a shame on Christian parents. That the children will know that mommy and daddy have not spoken for days. is a shame. What kind of husband are you? Keeping malice is, 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 is. <laughs> a man. <laughs> I can't understand. A man keeping malice. How are you doing it? How? <laughs> How can a man keep malice? Malicious? How? Your wife is greeting in the morning. <laughs> Are you communing with God? <laughs> it doesn't.
doesn't look like a, like a husband. It doesn't look like you. It's a shame. It's an embarrassment. Actually, you are a disgrace to Christian men. Keeping malice. And you're even proud of it. I've not spoken to her. This is two weeks now. It will hit one month. Ah! Any man that keeps malice, don't marry him. Sisters, are you hearing? Yes. Observe them in church. All these single brothers that are moving around. Any one of them that has tendency for malice keeping, don't marry. Don't. Don't. It doesn't even make sense. How, how are you keeping malice? If you keep malice, you're a bad husband. You're a bad example of Jesus. You must know how to tolerate. Don't keep people's sins. Don't keep their record. Love must flow from the husband. See, Jesus died for us and made us new creations. He not only died for us, he made us brand new people that don't have any record. A new creation in him. He gave us the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave us his word. He gave us all things that pertain to life and God. He has given us everything. And after giving us everything plus Holy Ghost plus himself plus the blood plus everything. You know after giving us all. He still tolerates us even with all when we make mistakes. You know your wife does not behave well. You collect the key. Say that guy bought for you won't drive it. Drop it. Enter keke. Your wife is jumping keke. You are driving fine car. What kind of husband are you? I will soon get there. You, you are driving fine car. Your wife is jumping inside na pep. Rickshaw. She's jumping rickshaw. You, it's only you and you are, you are fine suit. Your wife is carrying leather bag. Eh? Papa, coconut, everything is another one. And she's jumping inside rickshaw. You naughty know, you're carrying nothing. She has one child with her. They are jumping inside Kekena Pep. You, you are driving fine car. What kind of husband are you? Which kind of husband you be? Christ won't do that. Christ lays down his life. He wouldn't do that. I was soon close. Just wait. Some of us only walk in love outside our homes. You know, you come to church. Sister, come. It looks like you have not made your hair. Take. Brother, come. It looks like uh, you need something for lunch. Take. Sister, come. Come. Uh, Take, have lunch. Your wife is hungry, your children are hungry. He said, Daddy, give us money. Ah, stop that! <laughs> You're only walking in love outside. Hypocrite. Hypocrite. What did I call him? Help me shout it so that you he will hear us. I won't close. I won't close. I won't close. <laughs> so you say, if I like, I should cut you with knife. You'll be fine. No problem. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, familiarity can make you think the person does not deserve your love work. Being with somebody in the same house, your wife, your husband, you become too familiar. You may think that the person does not deserve your love work at all, but that's wrong. Where you really need a love work is in your home where you have offenses, where you have misunderstandings, where you have issues arising steadily and you are living there all the time. That's where you need a love walk. That's where you need to forgive. That's where you need to tolerate. That's where you need to be careful not to take things for granted. That's where love is supposed to begin from. Amen? 
I said, Amen. Amen. Treat your children like your friends. Chat with them. Talk with them. Don't be a terrorist in the house. Be a friend of your children. Tomorrow I'm going to start talking about children, parents and children. You don't want to miss it. So at home, gather your children and sit before the radio or TV set. Because it's going to be exciting tomorrow. As we begin to look at children and parents and things that happen between parents and children. Hallelujah. You must tolerate. You must tolerate. If you want to know whether you're born again or not, get married. Get married. Once you get married, we will now know whether you are born again or not. Because that's where you will see the fruit of the spirit in practical demonstration. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, temperance, long suffering. <laughs> Stand on your feet. That's a good place to close. <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody get him blessed. Shout a powerful amen. amen. Am I teaching good this morning? Yes. Husbands, are we blessed? Yes. You love with forgiveness. You love with tolerance. You tolerate. Tolerate your wife. Tolerate your children. Because sometimes it's tolerance you need. Sometimes children can be overbearing. But you've got to tolerate them. Sometimes your husband too can be overbearing. You've got to tolerate him. Remember what I said last week. Don't be committed to your wife. Don't be committed to your husband. Be committed to the word of God. If you're committed to the word of God, you'll be committed to your wife. If you're committed to the word of God, you'll be committed to your husband. That's where it begins with. Be committed to do the word. Make the word of God your lifestyle. Make the word of God your standard. And then you'll have a home that is blissful. A home that pleases God. Hallelujah. That's the ultimate intent. To please God. You're married to please God. Your home is a place where God is pleased. Can I have a powerful amen? amen? Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to teach. The opportunity to bring light and clarity from your word. And thank you that your word is backed with power. Because no word of God lacks is, shall, be, shall be void of power. The power that goes with your word is to make our lives better. So I ask that you confirm your word with signs, wonders, miracles where miracles are needed, families that need healing, let the healing power of God flow right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you that homes are getting healed, relationships are getting healed, and thank you, Lord, that you're perfecting your people, bringing your people to a place where they live lives that glorify you. I give you praise for answered prayer, and I decree right now, whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. In the name of Jesus, sick bodies be healed in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name, and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. I didn't hear that amen like thunder. Amen. I'm about to close this service, but remember, I will continue with husbands in the second service. That's really where I'm going to focus on husbands because we lay foundation before we build. So you don't want to miss what I'll be teaching in the next service on husbands. Grab a good offering, everybody. Let's give in honor of God's word. All over the building, grab your offerings online. The banking details are scrolling. On television, the banking details are scrolling. We give in honor of Jesus. We give in honor of what he has done. We give in honor of what he has made available to us. We honor him. Every time we give, we give us responsible children of God. We give us responsible sons of God's family. We give us children who have understood that our father's business is still on earth. And that business must be carried out. That informs our intentional givings. And we give to honor the word we have just heard. Amen. Lift up your offerings. Father, we rejoice that we give in faith. We give with joy. Our offerings are a sweet smell before you today. Thank you for everyone giving. I pray for those in need right now and I decree that your needs are met according to his riches in glory. In the name of Jesus. Your needs are met according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank you Father for the blessing. In Jesus precious name and every believer says that amen like thunder. Praise God. Well ladies and gentlemen you know we love you the online community we're going to sign you off right now but remember in the second service at 11 a.m. GMT plus one we continue talking you know concerning the husbands our relationship with husbands and you know regarding marriage and homes in, in the next service. It's going to be powerful. Get more people to be part of it. 
But we love you guys. Radio audience, I'll be joining Mr. Michael Bush in the next few minutes. He's going to tell you how to send in your offerings and all of that. But we love you and we're so glad that we're able to bring you the word and serve you the grace of God. Always an honor and a joy to do this. All right, so looking forward to seeing all of you in the next service at 11 a.m. GMT plus one. And until then, enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service this morning. Glory! Amen! Amen. Woo! Glory to God! By this message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com. Thank you.